uniting the races with truth instead of dividing them with lies. We also rebuild the family by rebuilding the man. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Welcome to the third hour of the show today. Amazing how fast time goes by. You can get involved by calling 888-775-3773, 888-77-JESSE. Before I get to my guest, a uh, white pastor repents uh, for white people's racism toward blacks. Pastor Daniel Hill, who is with me, of River City Community Church, joined Black Lives Matter uh, Believers Monday to denounce white system of oppression um, for devaluing so many black lives. And before I get to my guest, the pastor, I want you to hear the prayer. Andre, I want to go to C, uh, CNN. Brooke Baldwin plays a clip of white Chicago pastor praying about white racism at this Black Lives Matter rally. Listen to the prayer. In the hours after Chicago police officer Jason Van Dyke bonded out of jail on murder charges in the death of 17-year-old Laquan McDonald, Black Lives Matter protesters rallied outside that jail. And one of those protesters was a local pastor by the name of Daniel Hill. And Pastor Hill is white. And for a moment, he turned the protest staging area into a pulpit. He openly prayed and confessed before the crowd, asking God to forgive his white brethren and sisters for devaluing so many black lives. God, if I may be so bold as a white male to Jesus. confess on behalf of my white brethren and sisters yes. for the history we have brought to this moment, a history of holding our people, our color, our kind as the epitome of most valuable and of devaluing so many other people, of devaluing so many black lives. And none of us want to say it out loud, but we show it in the ways that our systems play out every day in our country. We see it when brothers and sisters made in your precious image are shot down and shot over and over and over. We, we think of the precious blood shed in this city by Rakia Boyd, by Laquan McDonald, by so many whose names are precious to you, and we repent. We repent of the violent acts done in the name of racism. We repent of the apathy that has caused so many of us to sit on the sidelines and just watch in a bewildered state. We confess of everything that has gotten in your way of righteousness and justice flowing like a river. We confess the ways that our white supremacy has infected our judicial system, the way it has infected our police system, where it has minimized the lives of other people. I wanted you to hear the prayer. It's a long prayer, but it's a prayer that's heard around the world by everybody and their mama. And I have Pastor Daniel Hill with me today. We're taking your phone calls at 888-7753-773, 888-77-JESSE. He is the pastor of River City Community Church in Chicago. Pastor Hill, thanks so much for being here, sir. Reverend, good to be with you. Thank you. You could call me Jesse, and uh, we're right. we're Skyping with uh, Pastor Hill here right now. Um, very interesting prayer, a surprising prayer, and I'm also surprised to see that you're so young and you prayed that prayer at the Black Lives Matter rally. Let me ask first, uh, are you called by God to be a pastor, or did you go to school for it? <laughs> are those mutually exclusive? <laughs> yes. Um, I believe I was called by God. I also went to school. And when you say you believe you were, why do you believe you were? Why do I believe I was called by God? Yes. Um, I mean, I think there's the internal witness that I believe that uh, sense God's call in my life. And I've had a lot of folks around me who have affirmed that call. And so that seems like a important biblical idea to to be affirmed by those that you're in community with. And so if it is confirmed that you were called by God, what 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 was the purpose of going to school? Because if he called you, he would prepare you and guide you. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I'm I'm not saying that's the only path. I think for me, 
Um, I enjoy learning, so anywhere I can learn with my own personal reading or going to school or anywhere I can go to continue to understand the word better, um, that's something I'm drawn towards. Oh, okay. And um, are you you married? You married? Uh huh. Yes. With the children? Yes, sir. And are you the head of your wife? Uh, yeah. You're the head of your wife? Yeah, I mean, I think the Bible says the husband is the head, right? And so you are the head of your wife? Uh, yes, sir. Does she know that? I mean, we're both, we both are committed to Scripture, so... Uh, oh, that's good. Why did you show up at this Black Lives Matter rally? What made you show up there? Um, well, I'm, I'm a pastor in a neighborhood that's uh, half African American, and so um, I'm part of a couple of different pastor networks here in the city of Chicago, and uh, th there's a lot of different things that we are attuned to, but... Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is one of the things that comes up often in our pastoral pastoral groups. And this group is compiled of black and white pastors? Correct. And, and others. Yeah. Is, is Black Lives Matter a good group? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. The group Black Lives Matter, is that a good organization or bad? Um. I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't, good and bad, I don't exactly understand. I mean, I think that what Black Lives Matter is talking about is something that seems like an important topic. So at that level, that seems good to me. Is it a good group? <laughs> Can you give me a definition of what you mean by good? I don't Does usually it, use those terms. Oh, yeah. Does it represent good? Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't consider myself an expert on uh, the Black Lives Matter group. Uh, I think the idea of affirming the dignity in all people is a very biblical idea. And so to the extent that uh, they're affirming the importance of the dignity and worth of all black people, just like all people, I think that's a really important idea. So does Black Lives Matter represent the truth about what's wrong with black people and this whole race issue, do they represent the truth about that? I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't feel qualified to answer that question. I mean, that, that, that seems like a, like a massive one. So I, I think there are truths that they're representing that, that bear witness to Scripture, then that, that's where um, I, I think it's important what they're doing. You don't know a lot about the group? No, I didn't say that. I said I just I don't feel like I'm authorized or equipped to be able to be the one to judge whether the group is good or not. Why not? You're a man of God, and you went there and repented by way of prayer for white racism. Why is it that you can't judge whether Black Lives Matter is a group of truth or not? Well, th this, was an this was not formally billed or thought of as a Black Lives Matter protest. Um, I think that she might have said that on CNN, but this was, this was a, a group of clergy who wanted to pray together and... Um, um, so we organized it ourselves. So there was no formal affiliation with Black Lives Matter or any other um, organizations. So, but you still pray there and you pray for this uh, uh, repentance of the sins of white people when it comes to racism. So you don't know if Black Lives Matter is, a, it is um, a, a, an organization of truth or not. You're not. You don't know. Is that right? Um, yeah, I... I my understanding is that one of the major themes of Black Lives Matter is acknowledging that black lives are not always valued in this country and that it's bringing attention to the fact that there's God-given dignity to every African-American person and that they're representing that. So to that degree that I understand it, I think that that is definitely truth from Scripture. So am I understanding you in that you participated as, with a group that you didn't know much about? Uh, no, I don't think that's an accurate statement. I'm, what I think would be more accurate is to say that a group of pastors planned a prayer meeting, and I was part of both the planning and praying of that group. Do all lives matter? Yes, of course. Or is it just black lives matter? No, of course all lives matter. All lives matter? Mm-hmm. Um, you prayed for, uh, for God to forgive white people for devaluing black lives. Is that true? Uh, yes. Um, uh, were you including yourself? Yeah. So you don't value black lives? 
Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. I, when I prayed that, I didn't, of course, know it was being recorded. So um, I found that out later <laughs> on. So that was very much praying in the moment. But um, what I was praying for is more at a corporate level in the ways that we syst- systematically devalue Black lives. And I think that um, I'm certainly complicit with systems and structures that do that. You would not have given that prayer had you known it was being recorded. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that there's you know context for that, you know, so it requires a little bit of explanation is all I'm saying for the context. Do you devalue black lives? I mean, I certainly hope I don't at a personal level, but I suppose it's possible that uh, at an implicit or subconscious level, I still do. I think I definitely participate in structures that do. So subconsciously, you, Pastor Daniel Hill of River City Community Church in Chicago, devalue black lives. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very possible that I'm still infected by that narrative. How is that possible? Well, yeah, I'm sure you're probably familiar with the implicit bias test, right? No. Well, the implicit bias test has been taken over by over 5 million people, and it, it measures the thoughts and responses that we have to different racial groups, white, black, Asian, um, uh, Latino, and uh the data is overwhelming across all four groups that there's a strong preference for white people and that we just have less positive images with black people. And so, I mean, data would overwhelmingly suggest that we all um, value white people more than we do black people. And who did this test? I believe it came out of Harvard initially. And what was it done to you? No, Performed on you? It was done on other people and you fell yeah. for it. You don't know yourself well enough to know if you devalue black lives or not? Um, I know myself well enough to know that while I'm always working to be in line with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there is a very real force of sin, I think, that that darkens our understanding, and we're always trying to get free of that. So I include myself along everybody else in that, of trying to get free of any of the ways that the evil one masks our thinking. And you said rightfully so, that this test was right and rightfully so. When I come back, I want to understand what you mean by that. Then we'll take some calls at 888-77-53773. Back in a moment. My guest is Pastor Daniel Hill. He is pastor of River City Community Church out of Chicago. And he prayed that God will forgive white people for their devaluing of black lives. Um, And um, it was interesting to me, very interesting we're going to get to your calls. I'll, uh, he will speak to you at 888-775-3773. We are Skyping with the pastor. He can, I can see him, but he can't see me. What does it feel like not being able to see me, but I can see you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do wish I could see you. <laughs> uh, let me ask, that rally, just to be clear, it wasn't a Black Lives Matter rally? That's correct. And, and who was it again? It was eight pastors who organized it, just wanting to have a prayer vigil. Were there other white pastors there other than you? Yeah, there was. There were pastors of every racial and cultural group there. Uh, Okay, Um, and also this test that you that was taken to say. And if I'm wrong in the way I'm describing the test, just correct me on it. It says that when uh, people are approached or come in contact with white people that there is a better reaction to whites than it is to blacks. Correct. Is there a, is a negative reaction to black people and a positive to whites? Right. And does that make the person who react positively to whites and negatively to blacks, does that make them a racist? Well, I, 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 I think that it makes... It, it, it infects the way that the systems get played out because if somebody um, assumes they're not a racist, but implicitly they value white people more and devalue black people in their own perspective, then they're going to end up acting different towards them. Right. Uh, when And so that test, because you feel that way at times when you're around black people, according to the test, that causes you to be uncertain about how you feel about black lives? Well, no, I mean, I think to use, I mean, isn't one of the big 
themes that you do on your show, trying to cast out lies to kind of name lies and remove lies. Yes. And something, right. So I, I think it's one of the lies that's part of how our country has been formed that black people are less valuable than white people. And so it's just acknowledging that the spiritual powers are strong and would advance that lie if at all possible. And that I think I and others need to be aware of that lie so that we can live in the truth. I don't know if anyone think that though. Um, let me ask, Jesse Jackson said that when he is walking down the road and he hears footsteps behind him, he looked back and he sees that it's white guys and not blacks. He feel better when it's white and not black. Does that make Jackson one of those people who devalue black lives? Well, I think it's confirmation of the implicit bias test. Uh, the, this, the test even says that black people have more positive images of white people um, than they do of black people. So I do think it's a, a lie or a narrative that's affected every person of every background. Is that because black people, not all but most, are very angry and a violent people? And so naturally you would have a sense of concern or caution to it. Are you a cautious, cautious when you're in their present, did they bring this upon themselves or did white people create this image of them falsely? I mean, I, I, I mean, at least for me, I, mean, I, I would start with definitely history. I think that the way that we created things, and I don't think it's just black people. I think, you know, I think we did it with native folks too. Um, in, the, in the Declaration of Independence, we call in native folks merciless Indian savages, which is a way of dehumanizing and uh, when the North and the South wanted to create some kind of a compromise for moving forward, as you all know, that we agreed on the three-fifths clause for how we viewed black people. And so I think the narrative did begin very early on in our country that black people are less human than white people are. But the, the three-fifths thing was based on voting power, had nothing to do with color. Yeah, but I mean, it's Yeah, it's still, but... Well, I mean, you're using language that dehumanizes, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's powerful white people agreeing on language that sees another race of people as less, less than human, even if the end goal was for voting rights. They still value the people. It wasn't dehumanizing them. It was just trying to, the South trying to maintain power by way of a vote. Mm -hmm. That's not devaluing. I mean, I think whenever you call another person three-fifths of a human being, however you frame it, it's still saying that let's less than whole. Not really, because there were black people who had slaves as well, mm -hmm. and they were in support of the three-fifths thing as well. Mm -hmm. Were they devaluing other black people? Yeah, I would Or say dehumanizing absolutely. other black people? And, and at least from my perspective, I would say absolutely yes. So are you saying that white people are innately, innately I think that's how you say that word, uh, evil people? Are you asking if I'm saying if are white people evil? Yes. No, no, no. Inherently, inherently evil. No, to use, I've heard you a number of times, you quote the Ephesians passage, right? I think that there are principalities of darkness that would advance a lie that is evil. And I think um, some people knowingly, but many people unknowingly are complicit with that lie. Um, so at this recording, where you, you uh, did this prayer, you did not know that you were being recorded. Right. And what it felt like once you found out you had been recorded. Uh, I mean, it was just it was just a surprise more than anything. We, we weren't actually expecting such a big turnout at the events. Um, it was put, put together three or four days before the event. So we thought it'd be just a small group of us with our congregants from our respective churches. Was this in response to Laquan McDonald shooting video? It was. Yes. Um, do you think the white officer should be charged with first de degree murder in that case? Uh, is that I, I, is that the degree murder he was charged with? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that sounds like a fair thing to do. Even though Laquan was on drugs, he was a criminal. He was in and out of foster homes. He had a weapon. He was breaking into cars, according to the report. Um um, he slashed police officer tires on their cars. You still think first degree murder is justified? I don't think there's any person, no matter how many bad things they've done, that should be executed for their crimes. So, yeah, I don't think he had the right to kill him because of anything he had done. Really? 
how about if other people's lives are at risk and it's the police officer job to defend the good from the bad? Uh, the criminal is not worthy of death if they're putting other people's lives at risk? Yeah, I mean, obviously it is a different situation if somebody's lives are at risk, but that wasn't what was happening here. They was walking away. And we see time and time again that we've seen a number of white shooters who are putting people at risk and they're, they, they're repeatedly able to, the police officers are repeatedly able to, to, to remove the threat without actually murdering the person. So we, we definitely see a double standard, I think, in how white criminals are treated and black criminals are treated. When you see Laquan, he was not walking away. He made a jerky movement. He was on, I believe they say PCP, right? Mm -hmm. So he wasn't walking away. Uh, he made a jerky movement. And so you, you, you don't see any issue with him being shot not only once, but 16 times? Not one iota. And you know why? Because Laquan should have thought of that before picking up a knife and going out to rob cars and put his own life at risk. So he was responsible for that, not the officer that shot him. Yeah, I mean, I think you and I would have to agree to disagree on our perspective on that one. You don't think Le Laquan brought that up on himself? Uh, I, I think that I think that there are a lot of people who make a lot of foolish mistakes and don't get shot down dead for doing it. So I think it was. Do you think reaction. Laquan brought that up on himself? I do not think he brought murder upon himself. No. Had he not gone out there and committed the crime, would he be alive today? I mean, I can't answer that, but I think just because he committed any kind of a crime or was high does not mean he was worthy of being murdered. Had he not gone out there and committed the crime, would he, and he wasn't murdered, by the way, um, would he be, I mean, would he have been shot by that police officer? If he would not have committed a crime, would he have been shot by the police officer? Yes. I, I, I don't even know how to answer. I mean, probably not. Let me take a break. Back in a moment. Straight to your calls. Okay, welcome back. I am Jesse Lee Peterson, 888-775-3773. Talking with Pastor Daniel Hill, pastor of River City Community Church out of Chicago. And he was caught praying with some other black preachers there in Chicago, um, asking God to forgive white folks for the sins of devaluing black lives. And we got to get to you. I just need to ask the pastor two more questions, and then we'll get to your calls. Everybody and the mama want to talk to him, of course. Pastor Hill, do you believe in innocent unless proven guilty? Yes. Uh, so you believe that the white officer should be um, innocent unless proven, considered innocent unless proven guilty? Until yes. proven guilty? Yes. So why are you condemning him with first-degree murder? I didn't condemn him. You, it's, that's what he's been charged with based on the initial evidence, right? So um, you're asking if I think that's the right charge. I say I'm, I'm affirming what's already been charged. That sounds like the right thing based on what the evidence suggests. But you call him a murderer. Yeah, I, it, from what, what, you, what we can see on video, it appears to be a murder to me. But you're not, con you're not considering him innocent until proven guilty by calling him a murderer. There have been many cases where videos have been proven to be wrong, and you didn't see uh, cases where you didn't see the entire video. Just because it's on a video doesn't mean you really see what really happened. And you labor him a murderer already. Is that fair? Well, maybe it'd be more fair to say that I, I think Laquan was murdered without attributing who was the one who did it. So are, are you saying that it's not fair then for you to call the white officer in Chicago a murderer? I would say that I agree with you that everybody is innocent until proven guilty. And so are you saying now then that you are wrong for calling the white officer a murderer? Um, I, I could agree that it's presumptive to say that without having been convicted yet. So it, are you saying that you are wrong, Pastor Hill, for calling that white officer a murderer? Um, I, it would be my opinion from what I've seen that he is a murderer, but, um, you know, Perhaps I should not vocalize that opinion. So are you wrong for doing that? <laughs> Why is that word so important to you? Because it's the truth. I, I, like, I, I just love simple truth, and I'm black, and I'm a little slow, and when you, when you dodge around the question, it leaves me hanging. 
Uh, yes, it's wrong to call him a murderer when he's not been proven that yet. And so are you wrong for doing that? Yes. Okay. Um, one, I just want to ask this, and then we're going to get to the phones here. Blacks are incarcerated at a greater rate per capita than whites. Do you know why that is? Um, well, I mean, there's a lot of uh, theories as to that. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly been influenced by the data proposed in uh, the new Jim Crow as to the war on drugs and the way that that's affected the black community. So you think that blacks are incarcerated at a greater rate per capita than whites because of the new Jim Crow? Well, uh, Michelle Alexander shows pretty definitively that drug use is similar in the white community and black community, but the black community is incarcerated at a much higher rate than the white community. So there would seem to be some basis for a clear sense of disparity there. So you really believe some stupid black woman who wrote the new Jim Crow and you fell for that? I think and very you're a man of, of God. So I would not call her stupid. I think very highly of her. And you're a man of God. And she's a woman of God. She's a Christian. You are a man of God, and you believe this black woman who wrote the new Jim Crow. Yes. Are black suffering, not all but most, due to racism or to like a more character? Um, I mean, I, I think I think that systems and individual uh, responsibility are always something that have to be um, dealt with together. So is it due to the lack of more character or white racism? Is black suffering, are you saying? Can you ask are black question? suffering due to white racism or the lack of more character? Um, I think that it's a multi-layered question. I think that black suffering is very much due to historical realities, very much due to current systemic realities. Um, I think, it's to your point, I think there's family issues that are in it. I think there's moral character. I think there's individual choices that are made. I think all of them combine. I grew up uh, on a plantation down in Alabama. I did yeah, the Jim, Jim Crow laws. I worked cotton fields and things like that. Mm -hmm. And yet we have family we believed in God. We didn't judge all people. We mm -hmm. treated people the way we would like to be treated. Abortion was, was almost unheard of. Um, there were blacks who owned land and, went and got education, you know, went and was, were educated at black universities. Uh, why were blacks doing better then with the Jim Crow law being in existence? Why were they doing better then than they are today when they could really do whatever they want. I mean, that, that's, uh, I, I think you've got a remarkable story. I've read about it. I think it's amazing. Um, I, I'm not sure that statistically that, I, I, that's not what I've heard is statistically black people were doing better then. So, so you um, listen to lies. You listen to race hustlers who only mission and purpose in life is to deceive in order to gain power and wealth. And I think it's time out for white people falling for the lie and helping support children of the devil, the race hustlers I'm talking about. Why are you doing this as a pastor? You go about what these race hustlers are telling you. Don't you know how to read and find out the truth for yourself? Uh, yeah, but you don't you don't agree with my reading sources. I just told you about somebody I read, Michelle, Michelle Alexander. She's, she's stupid. She's a hustler. Who do you believe, me or Michelle? Uh, I would rather not have to pit them against each other. I think that, you, No, uh, you I want think... the truth. Who do you believe? I grew up under the system. Booker T. Washington founded Tuskegee Institute. He was born enslaved. He did not hate mm -hmm. white people. He went on and founded one of the greatest institutions in the country, all while slavery and all that mess existed. Who do you believe, this stupid woman or me and Booker T. or Booker T. and me? I, mean, I think it's offensive that you continue to call her stupid. Because she's she's a hustler. You got to call Eva Eva, Reverend. I would not at all call what she is doing evil. I so who do you believe, Michelle or me, and Booker T? Um, well, I believe her. So if you're if you're putting those in contrast to you, I why mean, do you choose to saying. believe her? Because I think it's based on um, statistics. It's based on uh, it's um, very thorough research, and uh, I think there's a lot of truth in it. Blacks are killed by, it's not a lot of truth in there, by the way. It's a lot of lies, and it, it's meant to deceive. Blacks are killed by police at three or four times 
per capita rate, the per capita rate, uh, whites are killed by police, then whites are killed by police. Do you know why that is? Why do you think that is? No, I'm asking you. You I did mean, the would, prayer. You're asking why I think blacks are killed more often than whites are? Yes. Yeah, I think it's because of racism. You think the white cops are racist, not because the blacks are committing the crimes? Yeah, I think that there's, I think that there are deep explanations for why black people it's are simple. so tritely murdered. Because they're committing crimes. Let me take a break, sir. I'll be back. We'll take, we're, going, we're going straight to the cause back in a moment. Pastor Hill, let me just ask, um, you believe, you read this woman, Michelle book, and you believe what she had to say, right? Mm -hmm. Will you read my brand new book, The Antidote? Have you heard about that yet? Uh, I've heard of it. I've not yet read it. Uh, the Antidote, Heal an American from the Poison of Hate, Blame, and Victimhood. Will you get that book and read it and then come back on and tell me what do you think about sure. it? Because yeah. I'm getting the impression that you are just getting one side of the story as for the black life, the black life or whatever. Um, I think you need to start reading the other side of what black Americans are saying. They're, they're not going along with these lies that Jackson and Michelle and others are pushing out there in order to gain power and wealth by intimidating white people. So will you read the book and come back? Yes, sir. Uh, when will you get it so we'll know when to have you back? Uh, when will I get the book? Yes. I'll order it right away. Okay. And then we'll have you on, all right? Okay, sounds great. Um, is Obama a Christian? Uh, uh, yeah, I would say so. He says he is. And has he done anything in seven years to indicate that he is a Christian? Well, I mean, I don't know the guy personally, but I, when somebody says they're a Christian, I, uh, I, I, I use that as a starting point of saying that I believe him. In seven years, you've observed his fruits. Have mm -hmm. you done anything to show or indicate that he is a Christian? Well, I mean, it probably goes without saying that different Christians are going to have different perspectives of what kind of policies a Christian should do. But I've heard him say many, many things that would uh, affirm the fruits of his faith. Has he done anything to in indicate that he is a Christian? In his fruits, has he done anything to show that he is a Christian? Do you mean by policy? Anything. Yeah, Other than yeah, anything, has he done anything? Because you know the fruits of a Christian when you see them, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. has Barack Obama done anything to indicate that he is a Christian? I mean, yeah, I think he has many times tried to emphasize the plight of the poor and caring for them, and I think that's a very biblical idea. So, yeah, I would say that's clear fruit. Would a Christian support same-sex marriage or promote that? I'm, I'm not really wanting to argue policy stuff with you. No, this is not right. policy. These are more issues. Would a Christian promote uh, same-sex marriage? I mean, you already you already know the answer. There, there's Christians who fall on both sides. Of, I'm, of I'm asking issue. you your opinion. Would a Christian, and, and real fast because I want to get into some calls, would a Christian promote same-sex marriage? I'm sorry, just this is just getting. You know, I, I was I was happy to talk about the prayer rally. I just um, I'm not really feeling equipped to have policy discussions and go into such different topics right now. But this is not. Um, you know who Ben Carson is, right? Mm -hmm. He doesn't support same-sex marriage because he is a Christian. He doesn't support abortion. Do you agree with Dr. Carson? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna withhold on engaging in this subject matter. But sorry, I was prepared to talk through the rally and some of that stuff. If that's what you want to talk through at all. Are you a liberal or conservative type of guy? I'm somebody who has a very high view of scripture, and I take that very seriously in then, how I think about everything. Then why are you leaving the more issues out? That's. It's just it's just not the subject matter I was prepared to discuss today. So I'm, I'm, let's we can go, have a different discussion on that sometime. Okay, let's go to Thomas, the board is smoking here out of Delaware. Thomas, you're on with Pastor Hill. Yes, good morning, Jesse, and good morning, Pastor Hill. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, um, Pastor Hill, I don't think that uh, I appreciate you uh, apologizing for prayer. You really don't need to do that for white people. No more than I have to apologize for a black person <laughs> that goes out and commit a crime. 
But uh, with this uh, Laquan McDonald, I believe that was first-degree murder myself. Because, I mean, 16 times. This guy shot the kid 16 times. The kid's on the ground, and he's still shooting. No one else. No other cop. The kid was a there. The kid was a thug. The kid was it wasn't matter. some kid tipped on through the tulips. Oh wait a minute. Check this out. Oh, okay, he had a knife, but he was walking he had a away weapon. from the police. He had a weapon. Yes. Hey, guess what? What about the guy that uh, shot up the abortion clinic? Oh hey, Lord. So you gonna you yeah, gonna yeah, you gonna bring up you gonna bring up <laughs> one right. bad behavior that's to just right. to justify that's another? Right. Oh, okay. That's right. He and he shot a police officer. Anything else you want to say, Thomas? Anything else? Why is it? Why is it when a white person commits a crime, you don't call him a thug? You call the black person a thug. This this, the guy that committed the the crime in the abortion mill was wrong and evil for doing that. Likewise, was he a thug? And likewise, the black thug was. Was he a thug? Yes. Is he a white thug? Yes. You feel better. Okay, yeah, about time. But you won't say it unless somebody <laughs> force it out of you. Oh, you're forcing me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. Uh, let's go to the Baba Gota guy in Los Angeles. Baba Gota guy, you're on with Pastor Hill. Okay, first of all, I'd like to deal with Thomas, if I may. Thomas, you're an idiot. Um, that white guy who shot up those people in Planned Parenthood, he surrendered his arms. He put down his arms and came out and surrendered. That's why he wasn't shot. The black youth would not put down his knife when he was told to. That's why he was shot. Yes. End of story. Okay, now, on to the pastor. Pastor, you've got to get a hold of that book and start reading it. Listen, white guilt is prevalent among white people, and they are not getting the other side of the story. And after you finish that book, um, um, help me, Jesse, what's the name of that book again? Antidote. After you finish Antidote, you have to and come on the show you will have to get a follow-up book, our Booker T. Washington, Up From Slavery, in fact, all his books. And then Jesse's um, uh, book on... Um, uh, the scam. scam. Scam, How the yes, Black sir. Leadership you, Explores Black you America. Have to get, you have to get and read those books to arm yourself, sir, because these black um, racists, even though that's not a term anymore, these, these black, what they're actually trying to do is just get more money, wealth, and power that's unearned. They're trying to get it out of guilt. And white people have done more to help free up black people than any other race around. You just don't know all these things. Let me take a break. I got to take a break. Thank you, Barbara. Go to God. Let me take a break. When we come back, I want the pastor here to give out his website, and we'll squeeze in a few more calls. Back in a moment. Pastor Hill, you have a website or a Twitter account? Anything? I mean, a Twitter you'd like to give out or anything? Um, yeah, sure. My Twitter is at Daniel Hill 1336 at Daniel Hill 1336. Give me a quick answer to this. If black Americans, right now 73% are born out of wedlock babies. If black men and women were to turn back to God, love him with all their heart, soul, and might, get married, and be a spiritual and physical example for their children, treat people the way they would like to be treated, would they be in the condition that they were in today? Uh, I mean, I certainly can, where I can certainly agree is that that's God's design is that we live together in happy and whole families that are fully following God. So I think that that's a really important piece of moving forward. And why not push that rather than these lies of racism? Well, I mean, I think it's a mistake to separate them from each other. I don't think it's one or the other. I think that that's always calling people to live according to God's will and also understanding the principalities and, part, principalities and powers of darkness that... So- so are you saying, I asked, would they be in that condition, the condition that they're in today if they had this father and mother who loved God raising them? Would they be in the condition they're in today? Give me a yes or no on that. I, I don't feel like I can give a yes or no on that. I, I, for, for me to repent of corporate racism is very different than me being able to evaluate black America and what would be different. Based you don't on believe that. the order of God works? Now, I already said I believe the order of God works. Then why wouldn't they be in a better condition then if they got married and raised, had children or raised them? Because I think it's a, I think it's too narrow of a question for a much more complicated problem. So let's I go, agree that the order of God is important. Let's go to Tony out of Tennessee. Tony, I'm sorry but for the time. We have about two minutes left. God bless uh, you, Mr. Peterson, and Mr. Hill. Thank you. Thank you. 
uh, I just want to say, Mr. Hill, keep the good work up. Stay pushing forward on what you're doing because God is watching you, and he will forgive those people that you're telling to ask for forgiveness if they ask for it because it is a form of racism. We see the boys in Boston. We see the boy that shot up the movie theater, James Holmes. They don't, they kill who they want to kill. They didn't have to run that boy down completely like that. They could have shot him in spots where they could have apprehended him and took him into custody. Knowing that he was had, they, they should have handled that situation well, differently. Well, Holmes wanted to live. Well, it, it doesn't matter. I'm sure that boy wanted to live too. He just was so high, he didn't know it. Oh. You know, it's certain girls you get on there, they take over you. I, I got to run, Tony. Uh, Pastor Hill, thank you so much. Uh, get the book and come back on. Okay, thank you so much for having me. So I do have your word that you will get the book and you will come back. I will definitely get the book, yes. And will you come back? Uh, yeah, we'll take that one when we come to it. But I want to read the book. All right. But you sound like you, you won't come back. <laughs> thank you, sir. Organization of a new destiny.